Hello and good morning to all of you amazing human beings. Boy, it is a good day, huh? If you're anything like me, you still might be wiping the uh, red and blue face paint off from this year's annual insurrection anniversary party. The one time a year it's acceptable to roll out my Davy Crockett coonskin hat. Kidding, but did you hear that that man from January 6th, you know which guy I'm talking about with the fur and the horns, is trying to run for mayor or some major political position? I can't remember exactly, but the interview I watched with him was mm, sad. Can you imagine breaking into the Capitol building because you believe the system is rigged? only to then try and run for office using the same said system. Silly little insurrectionist. And that is about as political as I dare go today. Shall we get into something a bit more dark? Today, I bring you The Walking Corpse Killer. My name is Eli, and this is Murder in the Morning. My sources today come from Murderpedia, an article by Kevin Vaughn, and the rest I will list below. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I dream of the day I'm able to visit Australia. What a beautiful, expansive, and dangerous place, specifically today in the city of Sydney, where the majority of our story takes place. Plus, they have an immense selection of murderers to talk about and 81 confirmed serial killers. According to Britannica, the first sight of Sydney, whether from the sea or the air, is always spectacular. Built on low hills surrounding a huge harbor with a vast number of bays and inlets, the city is dominated by the bulk of the Harbor Bridge, one of the longest steel arch bridges in the world. Plus the Opera House, with its glittering white shell-shaped roofs, that seem to echo the sails of many of the yachts in the adjacent harbor. The intricate confusion of water and buildings makes a striking impression, either by day or night. Because of its history as a great port and its status as the site of the country's main international air terminal, Sydney is perhaps the only city in Australia with a genuinely international atmosphere. Yet it remains a very Australian city, with a nice compromise between its British heritage and the South Sea's attractions of its climate and environment. However, 60 plus years ago, in the 1960s, Sydney, Australia was a very different place. In the early summer of 1961, police found a man by the name of Amos Hurst dead in his apartment just outside Brisbane, roughly 10 hours north of Sydney. He was found with blood in his mouth and filling his lungs. No one had seen anyone enter or leave the apartment in recent days, and soon investigators simply deemed his death as, quote, accidental. What they didn't know was that this was the first of many gruesome murders to give even Jack the Ripper a run for his money. Only days later, on June 4th, police responded to a a report of a dead man found naked in the domain baths of Sydney, or for any non-Aussies, it was essentially a public pool slash bath area. The man, positively identified as Alfred Greenfield, had been stabbed in the face and neck over 30 times, plus the killer had removed his genitals. Neither the murder weapon nor Alfred's peen genitals were found. Investigators initially pegged this crime as a, quote, homosexual assault. No one would have assumed that these two bodies were related in the slightest having been hundreds of miles away from Amos Hurst and showing next to zero similarities in the MO. But then, William Ernest Cobbin was killed. Similar to the savagery of Alfred's murder, Cobbin had been stabbed repeatedly, and again, his genitals were removed, furthering the police theory that these killings may be sexually motivated. And it wouldn't be long before investigators had their next victim. In the suburban area known as Darlinghurst, a man walking on Little Bourke Street came across a person seriously injured on the road. They had been stabbed in the neck, chest, and face, and were bleeding profusely. 
but when he returned with help, it was too late. The man had to come to his wombs and died there on the street. Still shocking, but less so for the third time, the man's genitalia had been sliced off and taken with the killer. The deceased man was, la was later identified as Frank McLean. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, police believe the suspect leaped from the shadows of a nearby doorway as Frank had sauntered by. There were no eyewitnesses, as Little Bork Street has high banked walls. Investigators searched the surrounding backyards and nearby intersections for any remnants of the man's missing body parts. Having occurred only less than 200 yards from the Darlinghurst police station, investigators felt the suspect may be teasing them or simply growing more confident. And now that Alfred Greenfield, William Ernest Cobbin, and Frank McLean had all been mutilated and murdered in a similar fashion, police fear they have a, 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 a police fear they have a serial killer on their hands. One year after the first victim had been found, residents of a small neighborhood complained of a horrible stench coming from a shop owned by Alan Edward Brennan, an English immigrant to the area who had been missing for about three weeks. Quote, the smell was so overwhelming that neighbors called the health department, who in turn called the police. When they arrived, they kicked the front door in. The smell inside the shop led the police to a rotting corpse. Further investigation uncovered a nude body so badly decomposed that it could not be identified. The body was so putrid that a doctor had to carry, had to carry out the autopsy in a shed out of the back of the hospital. The only thing that could be determined was that the body belonged to someone in their 40s, the same age as the missing Alan Brennan. The body was eventually buried on hospital grounds, and police at this stage thought that the rotting corpse belonged to Alan Brennan, and with little to no other leads, they presumed him dead. End quote. Shortly after the rotting corpse was identified as Alan Brennan, a notice was put out in the obituary section of the newspaper. A man by the name of John McCarthy, who had previously worked with Brennan, was reading this one day and decided to attend his funeral service. A few weeks later, John McCarthy happened to be walking around Sydney when he bumped into a man he never thought he would see again, Alan Brennan. In disbelief to see his old friend alive, especially after attending his funeral, McCarthy blurted out, I thought you were dead. Alan Brennan responded in a panicked voice, leave me alone, and disappeared into the crowd. Confused and in shock, John McCarthy went to the went to the police to tell them of this crazy encounter he had with a walking corpse, a man who was supposed to be dead. According to Murderpedia, at first, they didn't believe him. They accused him of having had too much to drink that day, and he was told to go home and sleep it off. Determined, he went back the next day and tried to explain what had happened, but they still wouldn't listen. This persuaded John to go to the Daily Mirror, and he spoke to a reporter by the name of Joe Morris. McCarthy explained how he bumped into this, quote, supposed to be dead man, Alan Brennan. The reporter thought that the witness account was credible enough and decided to run the story under the headline, Case of the Walking Corpse. After the article was circulated, the police were forced to exhume the corpse, and after running a check on the fingerprints, they identified the body as belonging to one James Hackett, and not. Alan Brennan. Closer examination found that the body had several stab wounds and mutilation of the penis and testicles. I tried to just put genitalia in every single instance they use those, but rats. Investigators suspected this James Hackett fell victim to the same man they now refer to as the Sydney Mutilator, or as I refer to as the Walking Corpse Killer as the same men before him like Alfred or William. And Alan Brennan now was suspect number one. With one of the wildest twists and maybe biggest breaks in the case, police immediately put Brennan's photo in every available newspaper, basically around the continent, hoping someone would have seen him and know his whereabouts. Alan Brennan had taken a job at the Melbourne Railways and even attempted to change his appearance slightly, but it wouldn't matter. 
he was immediately recognized by a colleague and reported to authorities. At the station, Brennan readily opened up and confessed to the murders, which police had suspected, but he also told them that Alan Brennan was not his real name. He was actually William McDonald. Who was this William McDonald or Alan Brennan? According to one article, the serial killer who would become known as the Mutilator was born Alan Ginsberg, the middle of three children in Liverpool, England, 1924. He proved to be an unusual child prone to taking long walks at night by himself, and on many occasions, his mother had to call the police to go and search for him. He never sought company and remained friendless for most of his life. In 1943, at the age of 19, he joined the army where he was raped in an air raid shelter by a corporal who threatened him with death if he told anyone. Quote, at first, young Private Allen Ginsberg felt bad about what happened. But as time went by, he realized that he had enjoyed the physical experience and believed this may be the start of his life as a homosexual, a life he thought would bring him nothing but humiliation and misery. Being raped by this despised corporal would constantly be on Alan's mind throughout his life and would play a pivotal role in creating the horrific events ahead of him. When he came out of the army in 1947, psychiatrists diagnosed him as schizophrenic and his brother had him committed to a mental asylum in Scotland. His brother said this asylum was straight out of the dark ages. The cells were crammed full of raving, quote, lunatics, and it was freezing cold. He received shock treatment almost every day, but after six months, his mother eventually got him out and took him home. As he grew older, Ginsburg became an active homosexual, openly solicitating men in public toilets and bars. His obvious homosexuality made his life difficult in those conservative, to- in those conservative times, and he moved from job to job as the taunts and ridicule became too much for him to cope. During these times, he was also starting to worry about his own sanity. Allen, on his own account, consulted a psychiatrist in 1947 about his mental condition, complaining of illusions and strange noises in his his head. At the psychiatrist's recommendation, he spent the next three months in a mental institution, but it changed nothing. Disillusioned and convinced that his surroundings were to blame for his unstable mental condition, Ginsburg emigrated to Canada in 1949 and then to Australia in 1955, where he decided to start a new life completely and changed his name to William MacDonald. End quote. New name or not, old habits die hard, and shortly after his arrival, he was charged with indecent assault when he touched a detective on the penis in a public toilet in Adelaide, which is the capital of South Australia. McDonald was then placed on a two-year good behavior bond. Quote, he moved to Ballarat in the neighboring state of Victoria, but his life always seemed to be dogged with trouble. While he was working on a construction site, his co-workers continued to give him a hard time, and he retaliated by buying a very sharp knife and slashing the tires of their bikes. William MacDonald could only hold jobs long enough until the taunts became so strong that he had to move on from state to state, job to job, and all the time the urge to kill his tormentors was building up inside of him. Fact or paranoia, it seemed that no matter where he went, people would talk bad about him or make fun about him behind his back, and the corporal who raped him and made him the source of their amusement was never far from his mind." finally ending up in Sydney under the newest alias, Alan Brennan. After his arrest and readily confessing to the crimes, and basically blaming them all on this irresistible urge to kill, prosecutors could not wait to get into that courtroom. The trial started in September of 1963 and is still one of the most sensational cases Australia has ever seen. The public, the media, the jury, and even the judge were in complete awe as William MacDonald took the stand and described in great detail each of his gruesome murders. He told the court of his first murder in Brisbane and how he, bef- and how he befriended a 55-year-old Amos Hurst before strangling him to death in his apartment. William moved on to tell of his second victim, quote, Alfred Reginald Greenfield, 
was sitting on a park bench in Green Park, just across the road from St. Vin Vincent's Hospital in Darlinghurst. MacDonald offered Greenfield a drink and lured him to the nearby Domain Baths on the pretext of more alcohol. Once at the Domain, the need to kill had become overwhelming. MacDonald waited until Greenfield had fallen asleep. Once asleep, he removed his knife from the sheath and stabbed him approximately 30 times. The ferocity of the first blow severed the arteries in Greenfield's neck. MacDonald then pulled down the victim's pants, cut off his genitals, and threw them into the Sydney Harbor, end quote. William Ernest Cobbin would meet a death just as awful. Just before the attack, MacDonald put on a plastic raincoat. Cobbin was sitting on the toilet seat when MacDonald, using an uppercut motion, struck him in the neck with a knife, severing his jugular vein. Blood splattered all over MacDonald's arms, face, the plastic raincoat, and the entire bathroom. Cobbin tried to defend himself by raising his arms, but it didn't matter. Even after his victim had died, MacDonald continued to stab him over and over and over. By this time, the toilet cubicle was covered in blood. After he was satisfied, MacDonald began to pull down the victim's pants, cut off the genitalia, put them into a plastic bag along with his knife, and departed from the scene. At certain more grotesque points, during this uh, description, some jurors and civilians were reported to have fainted. As for victim number four, Frank McLean, his death was much more sloppy. MacDonald had attacked him with a knife and began to stab Frank repeatedly. That's when a man approached and found Frank bleeding out. MacDonald hit around the corner, and when this man left to notify police, he returned to finish, to finish the job and again cut off the genitals. James Hackett, his final victim, may have suffered the most if you can suffer more than what these men have gone through. Quote, on Saturday night, June 6th of 1962, McDonald went to a wine saloon in Pitt Street, Sydney. While at the bar, he met 42-year-old James Hackett, a thief and derelict who had just been recently released from prison. They went back to McDonald's new residence where they continued to drink alcohol. After a short period, James Hackett fell asleep on the floor, and McDonald then got out a boning knife. He stabbed Hackett in the neck, and the blow went straight through. After the first blow, Hackett woke up and tried to shield his oncoming attack. In his defense, he was able to push the knife back into McDonald's other hand, cutting it severely. William McDonald then unleashed a renewed homicidal rage on James and he eventually brought the knife down into his heart, killing him on the spot. MacDonald continued to stab his victim over and over until he had to stop for breath. Hackett's blood was all over the walls while MacDonald simply sat in a pool of blood next to his victim's body. MacDonald then, of course, began to remove his, vic his victim's genitals. The knife was now blunt due to the blade passing through Hackett's bones so many times. MacDonald hacked around the genitals a few times, and when he couldn't fully finish the job, he gave up. He was too tired to go downstairs or to get another knife, so he sat head to toe, covered in blood, and fell asleep. When MacDonald woke the following morning, he found himself lying next to, next to the victim's body, covered in this sticky, drying, blackened blood. The pools of blood had soaked through the floorboards and almost onto the counter into his shop downstairs. After cleaning himself of all the blood, he went to the hospital and had the wound in his hand stitched by a doctor. He told the doctor that he had cut himself in the shop, and after cleaning up the pools of blood best he could, MacDonald dragged the dead James Hackett and put him underneath his shop. Later on, after he had time to think about what he had just done, he became paranoid. He thought that the police would come looking for his victim, or he thought that if the police did come to his store to question him, they would see all the blood-stained floorboards and walls, which he obviously didn't finish cleaning. He became so paranoid that he fled to Brisbane, end quote. Keep in mind that during this entire confession to the jury, William had pleaded not guilty due to reason of insanity. And I feel like maybe his elaborate illustrations of all of these crimes was him trying to sell it 
or either just enjoying it. But his testimony was simply too much for anyone to comprehend, and the jury found him guilty and sentenced him to a life in prison, dubbing him a highly likely repeat offender. And there he remained until he died in 2015, becoming one of the longest serving inmates in the country's history. And that, my friends, is the awful, awful story of the Sydney Mutilator, or as I prefer, the Walking Corpse Killer. I hope you found that case interesting, as rough it, uh, as it was. But if you didn't, in the story, I did mention that our suspect was committed to a, quote, insane asylum straight out of the Dark Ages. And although I couldn't figure out which one he was admitted to, I'd still love to share a few other night marish institutions active during the 1950s. Uh, Excuse me. Given where we're at today with science and medicine, it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that doctors were still sticking ice picks through patients' eyeballs less than 70 years ago. The first on our list is the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum. Founded in 1948, and in 1907, they hired Dr. Henry Cotton as director. This man equated mental illnesses with bodily infections, and he wasted no time effing stuff up. According to Jacqueline Gray of Investigation Discovery, acting as the director there, it's reported that the doctor began removing patients' teeth after emerging research found bacteria was linked to syphilis. From there, Dr. Henry Cotton went on to remove the stomachs, testicles, ovaries, colons, and gallbladders of residents, leading to many, many deaths. Not only was a teeth pulling procedure conducted until the 60s, but many of Dr. Cotton's practices were done out in the open. The next on our list is the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, aka Bedlam. I could do an entire episode on the history of this horrible place, which honestly isn't a bad idea. Established in 1297, it was the first of its kind. The hospital was never good to its patients, for example, using rotational therapy, where you sit in a chair and they spin you up to a hundred times per minute. But in the 19, oh, but in the 1600s, it truly fell into chaos. The patients were subject to torture, experimental treatments, and basically anything the doctors wanted to try. The hospital would even sell admission for outsiders to come in and just gawk or laugh at these, well, victims. According to All That's Interesting, quote, It wasn't until more recently that researchers have learned just how disturbing the conditions at the hospital were. In 2013, construction workers at the hospital unearthed a startling mass grave of over 20,000 people, end quote. And finally, the Topeka State Hospital in Kansas. Jacqueline wrote in her article that when Kansas gave the go-ahead to castrate people with mental illnesses, the, Topo the, the Topeka State Hospital did not hesitate. They castrated criminals, epileptic, epileptics, and anyone they deemed a, quote, habitual idiot. It was also reported that patients were being assaulted and raped by the staff. According to Complex, one report detailed how a resident was, quote, confined in leather straps for so long, the skin was growing around the straps. This place would eventually close in 1997, after way too many years in operation. And those are some of the worst mental asylums institutions in history. I didn't know where else that would fit in, and I really kind of wanted to talk about it. So there you go. Blah. As always, thank you so, so, so much for listening today. And stick around for a bonus story after the credits, of course. Okie dokie. Bye bye. Love you. Welcome back to another installment of Let Me Read You a Story. 
I simply can't get over bloodhounds at the moment, and we've got another good boy named Yogi to talk about today. This article is titled, 1993 Killing of Inglewood 5-Year-Old Ali Barella's Solved, written by Kevin Vaughn. Quote, the 18-year investigation into the kidnapping and murder of Ali Barella's ended Tuesday where it began, with a now-dead suspect whose DNA matches genetic fingerprints recently extracted from the little girl's clothing. Test results from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation showed a definitive genetic match between those newly obtained DNA samples and Nicholas Raymond Stouffer, a welder who lived across a small apartment courtyard from the spot where five-year-old Allie was last seen. Stouffer, who fled Colorado on the day Allie's body was discovered in a duffel bay in Deer Creek Canyon, had long been the focus of the focus of the investigation, even after he died in Phoenix in 2001, 2001. Englewood Police Chief John Collins said at a news conference, we had to wait 18 years for the, for the forensic science to catch up with the evidence that we had on hand. Our case will be closed knowing that Nicholas Stouffer was the individual that caused the, caused the disappearance and the death of Ali Barellas. As Collins made the announcement, he was flanked by a dozen members of the Barellas family, including Ali's mother, Maribel, and the girl's brothers, Sam and Benjamin. She was a little girl, an emotional Richard Barellas said of his granddaughter. Five years old, defenseless, innocent. She probably called for help from everybody she knew when this was happening, but nobody could hear her. She was a small little girl, and I used to think of her as a victim, an innocent victim. When I got the call from the Englewood Police Department last week, it hit me. Allie's not a victim. I don't want to think of her as a victim. I don't want people to think of her as a victim. She's a hero, and she has been a hero for the past 18 years since she left this world. Allie Barellas was eating pizza with her brothers and playing in the courtyard of the Golden Nugget Apartments on May 18, 1993. A woman watching the children left them alone for a few minutes, and when she returned, Allie was gone. Police officers mounted a door-to-door search in the apartment complex, and later, throughout the entire neighborhood. Three days after she vanished, a police bloodhound named Yogi led officers on a 14-mile odyssey. From the apartment, down Broadway Street, along Interstate C-470, and then into Deer Creek Canyon. The search was halted for a day because Yogi was exhausted and simply couldn't continue walking. But the next day, just yards from where the dog had stopped, investigators discovered Allie's body stuffed into a green canvas duffel bag. The autopsy was inconclusive, but it is possible that her severe asthma had contributed to her death. Not long afterward, the investigation turned toward Stouffer. A second bloodhound blood blood led investigators from the spot where Allie's body was found back to the Golden Nugget Apartments. Her three-year-old brother Sam told detectives that the, quote, the old man had taken her. Sam then walked to the door of Unit 106A and pointed. Detectives learned that Stouffer had moved into that apartment just weeks before Allie disappeared and then headed to California the day her body was found. They learned that he was probably in his apartment as officers knocked on his door in the hours after Allie's Allie's disappearance, but never opened it. They learned that he skipped work the day after she vanished, that a friend had seen a green duffel bag in his apartment, and that Stouffer borrowed a car two days later that he may have used to dump her body in Deer Creek Cannon. Detectives questioned him in California, and later extradited him to Colorado on an outstanding drunken driving ticket. They took his hair and his DNA, and ultimately they took the case to Bob Gallagher, at the time the district attorney in Arapahoe County. Unfortunately, Gallagher decided that there wasn't enough to file charges. It was very clear that, I mean, almost very clear that he did it, but all the evidence was quite circumstantial. Over the years, detectives went back into the case file again and again, looking for something that was missed 
something that could be used, new angles to pursue, but they kept coming up short. In January, Englewood police detective Bobby Garrett took another look, and she saw, quote, red flag upon red flag when it came to Nick Stouffer. She decided to send some of Allie's clothing and the duffel bag to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation for tests using newly developed techniques for genetic samples. And when the results came, Garrett was stunned in the best possible way. One DNA profile collected from Allie's underwear matched Nick Stouffer. A second partial profile found on the waistband of her underwear also matched Stouffer. For Allie's family, the news was welcome, but bittersweet. Her mother and brothers could not bring themselves to talk about it Tuesday, fighting tears at times. And her grandfather, who has granted every interview request over all those years in hopes it would lead to a break in the case, grew emotional talking about the frustration of never being able to confront Stouffer. If Nick Stouffer had not died, he said, today I would be requesting to talk to him, confront him, and just put him on the spot and ask him questions like, why did he do it? Why did you have to do that to our granddaughter? Why did you have to kill her? End quote. And that is the sad but inspiring story, inspiring story of Ali Barella's and the ever-motivated bloodhound puppers. Again, I appreciate all of you who listen each week. Truly, a special thank you to Olivian out there for, again, everything. Okie dokie. I will see you folks on Thursday. Bye-bye. Love you.